All right. Good morning, Trinity. I am here today with Greg Garrett, who's the author of A Long, Long Way, Hollywood's Unfinished Journey from Racism to Reconciliation. And as you've been reading in our e-newsletter, um, we are actually having um, Dr. Garrett as a guest online September 16th and 23rd. We'll have some online discussions and learning. Um, I will have some registration details for everybody very soon in this Friday's e-news. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to have a little visit with Dr. Garrett and thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it, it, again, we are looking forward to these sessions. Um, I know a lot of our folks have picked up the book and, and have read it. I know folks are in the process of reading it. Um, give us a little background, though. What was the main motivator? What's your inspiration? What drove you to write this book? Well, there's, there's actually two kind of twin strains there. So I'll talk about both of those if I could. Absolutely. Um, one, is, one is purely personal. Um, I grew up in the Deep South, and although I've been at Baylor for 30-some years, um, and, you know, Baylor actually is kind of a Southern institution, uh, I started school in Atlanta and in Charlotte, uh, right after schools had been desegregated, and so there was still, like, this incredible tension around race, and I remember thinking that some of my white teachers um, treated um, my black classmates differently than they treated me. And so just in those early kind of stages of, you know, developing a, an understanding of fairness and unfairness, which you probably remember from kids and grandkids, those of you who are listening, um, that was one of my first um, actual memories. It's one of the, the things that has stuck with me longest. And so that has always been something that I cared deeply about, that prejudice and injustice were kind of uh, baked in um, to people's personalities. And then ultimately I discovered sort of into our systems, uh, our, you know, our institutions like the church, um, other things like that. And so um, one of the things that I wanted to do in this book, sort of transferring over from personal to professional is um, I wanted to find some ways that we could have good, hard conversations about race. Um, because we all know that we, we tend to kind of congregate with people who look like us and think like us and love like us. And, you know, it, it is harder and harder, it seems, for us to get out of our gated communities, whether it's political or cultural or religious. And um, so through a course of some public programs that I did in Episcopal churches uh, in Delaware and at Washington National Cathedral, um, I began to understand what I've always known from my teaching which is that story is the most profound way for us to get into hard conversations. And uh, so I was having a conversation actually yesterday with Kelly Brown Douglas, the great African-American theologian who's the canon theologian at Washington National Cathedral. And we were talking about how important this work is even now, even though there are a lot of people who are ready to move forward and begin um, doing some, some work on reconciliation. So film is probably our most powerfully emotional way of telling stories because it communicates in so many different ways. And we'll, we'll talk more about this in our evenings together. But, you know, my own experience in teaching film and experiencing film is that it takes us to a place emotionally that we can't get to starting from our, you know, our uh, personal starting points. So it's like you can have a great conversation about racism in Gone with the Wind, but you probably can't have a great conversation about racism at your Thanksgiving table. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So true. So true. Well, and um, the one thing that, you know, we've been struggling with here a lot is, is how to start those conversations, right, and how to make them productive. Um, and so you, that is a, an excellent point that this gives that common ground, right, that we have that shared experience of a film and that we can take it from that point and build off of it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the book does is it takes a look at 100 years of the treatment of race and prejudice in uh, mainstream Hollywood films. Um, so I start with Birth of a Nation from 1915, which is, you know, horrifying um, to, to most audiences in 2020. But the truth is that there are still a lot of white supremacist ideologies that we see reflected in that film, which were much more widely held in 1915, but they're still held by some people in 2020. Um, you know, those uh, people marching in Charlottesville a couple of years ago uh, with their tiki torches are, are chanting things that could have come out of, um, of um, Birth of a Nation. And, and so one of the things that I wanted to do in the book is sort of show our slow progress, you know, one step forward, two steps back as a nation, as we culturally and theologically tried to uh, make some sense of this, you know, um, this deep embedded 
um, national sin? How, how do we deal with racism? Mm -hmm. And um, so each of the films shows us a little bit of progress. And then I end with contemporary films like Get Out and Black Klansman and uh, Moonlight, um, uh, uh, really uh, profound and powerful films made by and starring people of color. Uh, where they not only get to tell their own stories, but they get to kind of push back in some ways uh, against some of the ways that Hollywood has depicted them. And so these conversations about particular movies, not just the stories, but also the, the kind of background and the history connected with them can, can also help us to understand how far we've come and, and how far we still need to go. Well, and your book is unique in that, I mean, we, you are just taking head on how theology and cinema dovetail, or is it a dovetail, or, or are they sometimes in conflict? Um, it, talk about that a little bit, how, how you're addressing that and what you've written. I, I think the best way to think about this, and uh, sometimes I get called a cultural theologian, mm -hmm. um, because what I'm trying to do is to take um, the way we make meaning in our culture, you know, whether that's through literature or music or film, and also the way that we make meaning through our faith traditions. And you asked, like, the really pertinent part of the question is, are, are these parallel or do they interlace? Mm -hmm. And it, the relationship can be very complicated. Um, and so one of the things that I tried to do in every chapter is to bring in the theological discussion about the films that are um, on offer. So, for example, our theological tradition pushes back very hard against birth of a nation. Uh, because what Christian theology tells us is that we are all children of God, that uh, in Christ there is no Jew or Gentile, no you know, male or female, um, that, that we are all equal in the eyes of God. And so, you know, theologically, Birth of a Nation advances this very powerful white racist mythology, and theology pushes back against it. And sometimes there is this intertwining. Uh, in the last chapter in the book where I talk about Get Out, uh, the great horror, like social horror film by Jordan Peele, um, I bring in a lot of uh, contemporary black theology. Um, and we were talking earlier about Kelly Brown Douglas, whose last book was uh, inspired by Trayvon Martin's killing in Florida uh, and the violence done in lynching and in other ways to black bodies over the last 400 years. And in that case, the film very clearly is talking about the same kinds of things that, that black theologians are talking about. Uh, and what the theologians bring in for us is just the, the God dimension. Where is God in all of this suffering? And I remember Kelly talking about preaching the morning after Trayvon Martin's killer had been acquitted. And her church was in despair. And I remember that uh, in her message, she said, as long as there is God, there is hope. And so, you know, where, where can we bring meaning even out of some of the most troubling uh, parts of our history? That's, that's where we lean on the theology, because sometimes the, the story can only take us so far. Absolutely. And you mentioned Get Out now a couple of times as far as like a contemporary film. Um, and that's one thing I wanted to ask you about, because right now so many of us are, you know, we're stuck at home with our video streaming services. Yeah. Um, and are there a few films, you know, they don't necessarily have to be totally contemporary, but I mean, what should we be watching right now to, to try to broaden, you know, our thinking and to get into this conversation? That is such a great question. I have two actual problematic things uh, that I've been talking about a lot. Uh, the most streamed movie during the pandemic has been The Help. Mm -hmm. And uh, those of you that have seen it know that it's, it's a very traditional sort of um, white person learns something about race by being around black people kind of film. Uh, so it's, uh, it's very much in the, the mold of Driving Miss Daisy or Green Book. Uh, and it's, it's a problem in some ways because this, it's, it's a film that it in, it's inhabited by a, a character that goes all the way back to Birth of a Nation. Uh, the, the maid or the mammy, uh, what James Baldwin called the faithful retainer, whose only real purpose in the story is to educate the white person and ultimately maybe the white audience. And so one of the things that I always try and do is to remind people that even though these are stories that I like personally, because who doesn't want to see the world become a tiny bit less racist, mm -hmm. um, maybe we should lean away from movies like The Help and more into movies that teach us more about black lives. Uh, and I'm doing a lot of these conversations with primarily white congregations who are like, we don't have a whole lot of black congregants. I don't know a bunch of black people professionally. How can I learn more about black lives? And so I think then if we start turning our attention to a film like Get Out or like uh, Black Klansman, uh, the films of Barry Jenkins, 
And then uh, a film that I talk about in the book, Do the Right Thing, which is 31 years old and yet still as relevant today as the day it was made. Um, and, and so that would actually be my suggestion, you know, to, to take a look at some of the, the films and TV that are being written and made by and starring people of color um, as a way of learning more, particularly if you feel like you have some gaps uh, in your knowledge or in your institutional knowledge. That's a great, great advice right there. Um, what makes you hopeful about the future of cinema? Um, mm. I know that we um, have had a lot of, you know, in the public discourse, particularly around the Oscars and what have you. I mean, you know, there, it's been a real discussion of making sure that black actors, filmmakers, what you know, screenwriters, all of these uh, folks, um, you know, are, are, that their art is getting the attention it deserves. Um, do you feel like we're going in that direction? And what, what is good and, and hopeful about this world of cinema? I think that there is a lot of hope for us going forward because one of the, the central things that has held back um, representation and diversity in film and television is that for a long time, the mainstream audience was largely white and Hollywood producers had this sense that white people didn't want to see stories about people that didn't look like them. And I think there have been a couple of films that have come out recently that have changed that um, that matrix. Uh, we, we lost Chadwick Boseman last week uh, as we're taping today. But uh, Black Panther, one of the most popular films of all time, almost no white characters in it. And yet audiences of all colors and creeds and cultures came to see it because it was an amazing story about our common humanity. Um, and then I think on a smaller scale about uh, a movie like Moonlight, um, which is a really sort of complex and literary uh, independent film. And it was the second or third time that I saw that film that I realized that no white character had a speaking part in that movie. Like I had watched and loved and become completely immersed in this story where there was not a person who looked like me. And, and so I think that's one of the, the most powerful things that's happening in our culture is that we have come to the sense that we are willing to partake of stories that don't consist just of people who look like us because we're capable of recognizing our common humanity. I mean, that's what great stories do for us. Um, but so I, I am hopeful uh, that we are moving in the direction, right direction and that, that some of these changes uh, are, are going to be permanent ones. And we need some hope right now. So that's good news. We'll, we'll hold on to that. So tell me, you're going to be with us, the Trinity folks, September 16th and 23rd. Mm -hmm. um, so we are looking forward to that. What are the main takeaways? Um, you know, if, if you can just do a handful of go to these sessions and I hope you come away with X, Y, and Z, what, what are those elements that you want our parishioners to learn? Well, usually over the course of two nights when I've been doing these lately, um, we end up talking a little bit about my own faith journey and my own journey with race. Uh, I am a white, middle-class, middle-aged guy. And so not necessarily your go-to expert for racism. Um, and so, you know, I, I talk a little bit about, you know, my personal story and, and um, my being sort of rescued by a historically African-American Episcopal church. I mean, that's why I'm here. That's why I went to seminary. Um, and then sort of the movement into the conversation about how stories, especially film stories, uh, can help us understand ourselves, our culture, and uh, God, and our relationship with God. Um, so I, I'm imagining that what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about uh, why people who look like me should care about race, and how that was driven for me, especially by um, my relationship with God and my relationship in the church. And then I think we'll want to talk some about the, the book and about the different films that are represented there and what we can learn from them. Uh, because there, there are important lessons for us, either positive or negative, sometimes both in the same place, uh, from each of the films that I talk about. And um, my hope is that they would help generate some conversation in um, your community at Trinity, uh, in the larger community in Fort Worth, that um, this could be something you know, that, that ripples out from our evenings together. Uh, because that, that's been the case uh, everywhere where we've, we've done these screenings or I've had these talks. And uh, that, of course, is the reason it would be so exciting for me um, to feel like we were doing something that is useful. And at this moment, uh, as you were saying, we need some hope. 
And uh, so for me, the most hopeful thing is to recognize that people seem to be willing to have these hard conversations if they can just figure out what to talk about and, and where to go with them. Right. And, you know, the time is ripe to do it. We, um, you know, we need to make things happen and make progress. And I know the folks at Trinity are very much looking forward to that. Um, thank you so much for your time today um, and for giving us a little overview. Um, for my folks at home, um, again, look for the Friday e-newsletter. Um, I'm going to have some registration links in that. Um, we will have some background information, uh, everything that you need to get ready for these sessions on September 16th and 23rd. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you then, Dr. Garrett, and thank you again for your time. You're so welcome. Can't wait to be with you all. Thanks again.